Yes. When you hop on, let us know where you're watching from. Or just say hi. <laughs> Hi, Joanne. From Massachusetts. Awesome. Hi, Jerry. Dorothy. There's a few more joining us here. Lori from South Dakota. Jokes today. <laughs> no jokes today, Jerry. We did not come we'll, prepared. One of these days, we'll get back to those. <laughs> Need time to come up with some new ones. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Sue. Sue. Very good. All right, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. We have a special guest with us today, Dr. Lawrence. Tavenga is with us um, from Multi-Men, and he's going to talk about what trace minerals are and how they fit into cattle, and also the overall profitability of a cattle operation. Be sure to ask um, your questions, put those in the comments, um, and at the end of this segment, we are going to be giving away a $75 gift card um, that can go towards the purchase of Multi-Men 90. So um, be sure you get any questions that you might have in those comments or like Melanie said, just say hello and let us know where you're viewing from. Um, and with that, um, Dr. Havinga, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, if there's only one positive thing that came out of this whole COVID epidemic, it actually has highlighted the importance of some of these trace minerals. So I think by now most of you would have read, heard, or seen somewhere, uh, especially early on when the pandemic hit, the importance of taking enough zinc and taking enough selenium uh, in the face of a viral challenge. So uh, what I'm gonna do this afternoon is we, we're gonna talk uh, uh, kind of about a, a couple of different things on these trace minerals. So first, let, let's just talk a little bit about, you know, what are these things? What do they do? Where do they come from? And why do we need them? Why do cattle need them? And I think the, the, the four uh, that I want to talk a little bit about more in detail tonight are called essential trace minerals. So uh, let's just take those three words and tear them apart a little bit. So why is it called essential? Uh, I think fundamentally that means that, well, hell, if you don't have it, you're going to die. And, and that's exactly what they are. So when we look at essential trace minerals, it's something that all mammals, cattle included, should have. And they should have access to that every day. Now, there are certain times in their production cycle, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit uh, uh, about that in more detail later on, but there are certain times when, you, when both us and cattle need a lot more of these things. And we need to just uh, pay attention to identifying those times and then addressing those times because it has a, a big impact on health and a big impact on reproduction. And both of those are going to have an impact on profitability. So I said, okay, so essential means we need to have them. Uh, then it's called a trace mineral. So mineral means it's, it's, it's metallic. So if we look at copper, yeah, it's the same stuff as a copper pipe. Zinc, it's the same stuff uh, as a zinc plated uh, piece of fence. So those are definitely minerals. However, we feed them to cattle and we consume them in different uh, forms, which make them absorbable. And we said trace mineral. So what does trace mean? Well, trace means very little. Uh, so if we look at the amount of these trace minerals that go into a diet, we're talking about a part of a teaspoonful that goes into a ton of feed. So it is a very low inclusion rate. Animals need very little of it, but it is critically important that they get it. Okay, so now we've, we've talked about what these things are. Now, let's talk a little bit about what they do. 
So most of these trace minerals by themselves do nothing, but they need to get incorporated into enzyme systems in the body. And those enzyme systems, I call them circuit breakers. Uh, you, you, you all know, if you trip a circuit breaker, nothing happens. It's dark. Uh, a machine doesn't run. And these trace minerals, when they're com built into an enzyme system, they switch on a lot of these metabolic pathways in animals. So what are these things that we want to we want them to do. The first one is on the health side. If we have an animal that gets respiratory disease or pneumonia, we want that lung not to get damaged to the point where that animal dies or it becomes a chronic. So to protect sick tissue is a big part of these trace minerals. The second thing is when we put a vaccine into an animal, the animal has to take that vaccine, process it, built all of the memory and all of the protection out of that vaccine itself. Those processes all require a lot of these circuit breakers. So uh, when we want a calf or a cow or a bull to respond well to a vaccine, we need a lot of these mineral at that specific time. The same holds true for reproduction. When we are preparing a bull for a breeding season, we need to make sure that that bull has all of the building blocks to produce high quality sperm lots of it and that it's protected for use during the breeding season so again that bull is going to need a lot of these uh, essential trace minerals long before the breeding season starts about two months before when we talk about a cow a cow actually has two times in her breeding cycle where these things are absolutely critical the first one is before we breed her because that whole embryo that's going to form inside that cow that's going to grow and become a fetus all of that those processes all of that tissue that that cow has to make involve pathways requiring zinc copper manganese and selenium so you need all four of those you need them in the right amounts and you need a little more before you breed a cow now the converse is also true. When that cow prepares to drop that calf, I see there's a lot of people from uh, around the Great Lakes. Uh, they face a condition called white muscle disease. White muscle disease is just a cow that had too little selenium in the last 90 days of her pregnancy. So what happens is she doesn't have enough of that selenium to put into the calf. And unfortunately, if she doesn't have that selenium to put into that calf, now the calf is going to be born short of selenium and selenium is key in protecting muscle and helping that calf to actually use muscle so the calf is going to be poor in getting up poor suckling and one of the muscles that works the hardest is the heart so eventually the heart's going to stop beating and the calf's going to die so that last 90 days of a cow's gestation is also absolutely critical to make sure you get enough of these minerals in there All right so now that we know who they are, kind of what they do, let's look a little bit at uh, why do we need to pay attention to how we get it into animals. So if we look at the majority of trace minerals, where do they come from? And, and it's, it's very simple. I mean, cattle are, are grazers by design. So if we look at the majority of uh, trace mineral that goes into cattle today, it comes from two big sources. The first one is it comes from grass. It comes from the natural pasture, whether we use it as a bale or an ensilage plant or whatever, it doesn't matter. Forage contributes by far the biggest component to the diet. Then secondly, our water will bring a lot of trace mineral into the animal. Uh, some of them are good and some of them are not as great because unfortunately, uh, the good essential trace minerals that we need in animals are sometimes tied up uh, by other minerals. So if we look at the tie up that happens, where does that happen? Uh, it really happens in the, in the rumen. So it's, it's in the big old gut, uh, of a cow, uh, or a bull. And what happens is when the, uh, when that antagonism happens, uh, there's really three minerals that create problems for us when we talk about antagonism. The first one is iron. Uh, if you have red soils, there's very high iron in your soils. And I want to just make a comment here for the guys that buy uh, a free choice mineral or supplement that you feed cattle. Uh, 
uh, many, many years ago, the fallacy was started that that thing needs to be ready to work. And people put iron oxide into their free choice packs to color it red. And that's not the truth. Uh, those uh, additional iron that you put in there actually does bad things. It ties up copper and selenium and, and zinc and manganese. So uh, we need to manage iron. We don't need to put too much iron into our cattle. Uh, there's plenty enough of it in grass. There's plenty enough of it in water. So we don't need to put more of it uh, into our animals. The other two that kind of gives us a little bit of a problem is actually one comes from pasture, the Western US. If you're like, uh, uh, if you draw a line from, uh, I'm gonna say the Western side of Minnesota, you start there and you draw it down all the way to Louisiana. West of that, our forages are very high in molybdenum and molybdenum is a very good antagonist for copper. Uh, so it creates a problem where we don't get enough copper into our animals. The last one is something that we've kind of over time contributed to put more and more of this into diets. It's sulfur. And, and, and the sulfur that we bring into diets, we bring in in, in, in three different ways. Uh, there are some wells that are very high in sulfites. Uh, so water is a key uh, thing that you need to look at with sulfur tying up uh, copper and selenium. And then uh, the other two is is molasses uh, we use molasses uh, a lot in uh, compounding diets because molasses is uh, it has it stimulates appetite it stimulates intake so it's a way to bind the diet and it's also a way to get cattle to eat more but we just need to recognize that there's a little bit of higher sulfur in molasses and that uh, uh, can tie up copper and selenium and then the last one is something that comes out of the ethanol industry. So your distiller's byproducts are uh, pretty high in, in sulfur as well. Uh, so especially if you're in South Dakota and you're close to somewhere that has a high sulfur well, you're using distillers and you're using molasses, uh, it's going to be it's going to be challenging to bring enough copper and selenium into that diet through the through the mouth. So now that we kind of know how these things are impacted, let's talk a little bit about what what you can do about it. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, 12 years ago, we put the, the product Multiman 90 on the market. The product is an injectable source of selenium, copper, zinc, and manganese. Uh, and the reason why we developed an injectable formulation, which is completely different to what anybody else is doing, has been really, there's, there's three or four reasons for us doing that. The first one was uh, we actually bypass any of these minerals that can tie up something in the gut. Because we inject it under the skin, we put it systemically into that animal and that animal can utilize it. I don't care what diet it's on because we bypass the gut completely. The second thing is it works very, very fast. So if we vaccinate an animal today and it may be a little short on selenium or copper and we want to put more selenium or copper into that animal, if we're gonna feed it up it's, it's only gonna reach higher levels in the animal that can work with the immune system at about 28 days after we start that. Well, you don't always know which date you're gonna vaccinate those cattle. So the technology in Multiman also allows you to rapidly supplement an animal. I mean, we, we reach peak blood levels within eight to 10 hours after we inject that product. So if you're gonna vaccinate cattle today and you wanna make sure that, that those cattle have enough uh, zinc, selenium, copper, and manganese to really take that vaccine, process it, and produce memory and, and protection from it, you can use Multiman the same day as you put a vaccine in, and it will allow that animal to mount a good immune response to that vaccine. Now, that gives us the opportunity to spend money when we need it. So I'm going to just revisit quickly, when do we really need to pay attention to the mineral status of cattle? And if you don't do that, what do you lose? So let's take a bull and we're going to start with, with the males, then we we'll go to the females, then we we'll go to the calves. So if we look at a bull, uh, if, you, if you're just using a herd bull to breed your cows, the most important time to pay attention to the mineral status of that bull or where you need to have a plan to get more mineral into that bull is the 45 to 60 days before you start your breeding season. Because in that 45 to 60 days, you have some sperm that's maturing, so we want that sperm to mature really well and be 100% effective when that bull starts working. At the same time, we've just started making some additional sperm 
And that sperm cycle takes 63 days. So that's going to be the, I'm going to say the volume that tops off when that bull starts working. So we also want to have enough mineral in there for that 45 to 60 days that we actually enhance the sperm that's going to be used later in the breeding season. So I just want to tell you that that's the key window to look at bulls. Now, what happens if we sloppy, if we, if we forget about it or we don't do something and, and for some reason we don't get enough mineral into those bulls, what is the impact of not having enough zinc, selenium, copper, and manganese on a bull's uh, sperm? And it's really twofold. Uh, it impacts, firstly, the morphology, so it's, it's the quality of that sperm, and typically it's, it's, it's with, the, with the swimming mechanism. So you'll see midpiece or tail defect. Uh, and, and, and the sperm is just not going to be of a good quality to fertilize a cow or a heifer. Secondly, as a direct result of that, you're going to see poor motility in that sperm. So they're not going to swim straight to go uh, perform fertilization. So uh, typically what we see very vet many veterinarians do is if they test a, a bull and that bull uh, fails that uh, breeding soundness examination, they'll do an injection of Multiman, give it 30 to 45 days and retest that bull. Right, so, so we've taken care of the male animal. Let's look at the females. Now I'm gonna handle uh, heifers and cows as the same, but I do want you to remember one thing. Uh, when we talk about heifers, and this includes not only a heifer that is being bred for the first time, it's also that heifer that is just calved and actually has to re-breed. Both those heifers are still growing and both those heifers have a higher requirement for these trace minerals than a breeding a mature cow. So not only do they now have to take care of a calf or a fetus or an embryo, they also still have to take care of themselves because they're still growing. So just be aware that the heifer actually needs a little more than the cow uh, and just factor that into to your planning. But the two critical time periods from a reproductive perspective uh, for females are, are as follows. So the first one is that we know of 30 to 60 days prior to breeding. So it's 30 to 60 days prior to breeding. And if, we, if we're sloppy there and something happens and we can't get enough mineral into those female animals, we suffer two, two different things. Uh, the first one is we, we see a reduction in uh, breed back. So our calving percentage drops. Sometimes it's very subtle. Sometimes it drops only like 3% if we don't pay attention to minerals. Uh, but I was involved uh, with some research in Texas where we had a, a little bit of a dry year. So the body condition score was down. And when the minerals went low, the combination of that two dropped that. Uh, uh, if, if you looked at the group where just the minerals were taken out, there was almost an 11% drop in preg rates. So don't underestimate the importance of this in pregnancy uh, attainment in those cows. The second thing is what we try and aim for always in a breeding season is we try to get as many cows and heifers bred as early on in that breeding season as possible. And there's two benefits to that. The first one is something that people don't, you can't really measure it, but if you breed them early, they'll calve early and they'll have enough time to recover from that breeding and be bred the next one. So it keeps that cow in, or heifer in the herd if they calf early. If they start late, if they calf in that last, I'm gonna call it the last 90 or the last 30 or 20 days of your calving season, you always have the risk that that, that animal is gonna test open at either the following, or maybe two breeding seasons down the road because they don't have enough time to, to, re to recover themselves. So now the, uh, the following uh, is, is very important because if we don't have enough minerals in that 30 to 60 days, we unfortunately start seeing slippage of early pregnancies. And what we start seeing is we get a lot of cattle bred in the second or third cycle uh, of the breeding season. So, so it's, it's imp the one big benefit that they give you is you get more cows bred earlier in that, uh, in that breeding season. Now, the, 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 the dollar benefit of that is every calf that's born in the first 20 days of that calving season, if you compare it to the second or third uh, 20 day cycle, that calf's gonna be 20 days older. And when it comes to weaning time, that calf is gonna actually be 
almost 40 to 45 pounds heavier, which is dollars in your pocket. Uh, so I always tell guys, you know, uh, especially if you're going to tag calves at birth, uh, I mean, we all go through a drought at some point. So if you tag calves at birth, all the calves that are born in the first 21 days of your calving season, take a knife or a pair of scissors or something and just cut the corner of the tag off so that you've got them identified. Those are the most efficient animals out of the most efficient females on your specific branch. Those are the ones that if ever you have to sell animals due to drought, they are the ones you keep because they're going to keep it. They, they, they're early in that season and they're going to stay early in their season. And there's actually research to show that their calves stay early in the season as well. Now, the, the second area that we need to pay attention to is if we've got them bred, we need a high quality calf out of those females. And all of the mineral that a baby calf is born with, just like a baby human, one of the first things the doctor will do when a lady is confirmed to go have a baby is they'll put you on supplements. And it's no different in a cow because in the last 90 days of a cow's gestation, all of the mineral that that calf is going to run off for the first 90 days of his life is built into that calf from the cow. So the cow really drains herself, puts it into that baby calf, then that calf's going to hit the ground and it's going to be in good shape. If the cow is low, she can't do that. So if we starve a cow in the last 90 days of pregnancy, we do a bad thing to that cow and we do a horrific thing to that calf. And that's where diseases like white muscle disease, weak calf syndrome, all that stuff come from. It's purely because the cow was not able to take good care of that calf while it was still uh, inside of her. So that, that's that's kind of where we need to really focus on uh, with, with with supplementing these animals. So if we look at Multiman and, and the product, when, when do we use that thing? So we only advocate the use of it if you look at the label at these bottleneck times. So we give it to a bull 45 to 60 days before we turn the bull out. We give it to a cow any time between prep check or day of prep check right up to 30 days before calving when you if you do scour shots you can do it right there that's perfectly fine and we do it again uh in that cow only a second time in the year we only do it uh when uh when we're about 30 to 60 days pre-breeding we do the same with the heifers now in calves it's a little different so if a cow was was well supplemented that calf is going to be solid when it hits the ground our risk with a calf is at day 70 to 90. Because they grow so fast, they just outstrip the amount of mineral that they have in them. They're not really eating at that point in time. They're drinking milk. And cow's milk are very poor in these trace minerals. So uh, we need to just be, you know, be aware of that fact. So when we do the first calf food vaccinations at 70 to 90 days, that's really when a calf uh, could really do with a good supplemental uh, injection of mineral. The same holds true at weaning. Uh, intake is very, very variable between, you know, that day 90 and, and, and weaning. So that's really where we use this product. We use it to drive two main streams of income. We reduce the number of cattle that get sick. Why? Because we provide the building blocks for those cattle to respond really well to a vaccine. So we empower them to have a functioning, sound, healthy immune system that can actually make good use of the vaccines you're giving it. And secondly, we drive income through reproductive enhancements by making sure we have a bull that really can breed a, a lot of cows efficiently. And we we breed we, we make money by having more females become pregnant, but also making pregnant early in the breeding season. So I think that's a that's a whole mouthful, but that's really I think what we wanted to say. Now, I always need to give you a little bit of practical advice. And then I'm going to shut up and we can go through the questions. But a couple of practical things. I don't know. The guys of you that have ever used Multiman, you'll see that it's a very easy to syringe product. It's thin. It's like water. So it's very, very low viscosity, just, uh, just like water. So when you inject that product, where does it go? It always goes on the side of the neck. You'll see it's labeled for subcutaneous use only. So you've got to pull the skin away a little bit and put it in underneath the skin. Now, the typical dose in a mature cow or a weaned calf is five cc's. 
So it's a little bit of a volume of product that we put in there. Now, what happens if you inject water underneath the skin? Is it going to stay there or is it going to run? Well, gravity is real. It's going to run. So just a practical thing, don't ever inject Multiman above another product. It might run into that product. And when those products combine underneath the skin, the animals would, you know, they're going to swell. They'll mount a, a little bit of a reaction there. So we always put Multiman as our lowest product, sub-Q, in the neck, and always follow the label recommendations. We do not give any more than what the label states. Uh, these things are essential trace minerals, but they're not, uh, you know, they are, they are things that if we overdo them, they bring risk. I saw one question here from a lady that says she uses trace minerals in her horses. They love them. I worry they're taking too much. That's a very, very valid question because with all of these minerals that we supplement, you should see a recommended intake level on whatever product you use. So it might say you need that they need two ounces a day or four ounces a day. If you see that over consumer, you need to take it away. Uh, if we look at the, the, the minerals that can cause problems for us, it's really copper and selenium are the two, uh, and horses especially are sensitive to selenium. So uh, if they overconsume, it means that that product does not fit that animal. In cattle, we actually, we can use salt to limit intake. Uh, if they eat too much of the product, we can blend in salt uh, and that'll cut back their intake. But uh, on, on monogastrics like swine and, and horses, I, I prefer if they overconsume, just take it away and find another product that they actually uh, will consume the targeted income because horses and, and swine are they're, they're really sensitive to, to selenium. Uh, let's just check some of the other questions here. Um, the, there's a, a question here. It says, this for cattle operation, which is the best? Trace mineral blocks, loose mineral, or mineral tubs? Now, it's a really good question because our single biggest challenge with cattle consuming enough mineral out of a supplement uh, hinges on three different things. So the first one is the, is, is the reason why we develop Multiman is, is purely because cattle are not smart enough to consume more when they need more. They're just like kids. Uh, you can put the broccoli there. It's really good for them. But uh, they're not going to eat it. They, they're going to they're gonna hit the ice cream or a chocolate bar or something. They're never going to hit that they're never going to hit that uh, broccoli, I guarantee you, unless they're a really special kid. But they are no different. Uh, they don't know when to medicate more. You know, they just don't know that. So our single biggest challenge with cattle is intake, to get consistent intake every day with every animal. So we see variation in two, two, as two problems. One is there's big variation between the animal that eats the most to the animal that eats the least. So they're not uniform. They don't all consume. If the bag says they should consume two or four ounces per head per day, uh, they don't all do that. There are some that eat more, some that eat less. And then there are some days when they don't consume anything at all. If you turn cattle out to a new pasture or if it's rained and you, they got access to green grass, for a while they won't hit that feed bunk at all. They're not going to be interested in your mineral when they got green grass. So intake is our number one issue. So how do we manage intake? What is the one formulation that we can use that has good intake? The, the, the loose mineral, your free choice mineral, is the one with the most consistent intake. Uh, if we look at a mineral block or a tub, uh, they are all compressed solid things. So to get the right amount into that animal is a challenge just with that formulation. Now it's better than nothing. You know, if that's the only thing you can put out, then put it out. But uh, of those three that the question was asked about, the loose mineral or the free choice mineral is by far the one that gives the better quality intake. Uh, then there's a question here, uh, can they get too much mineral or do they take in only what they need? No, they can definitely get in too much. So 
that's why you know if if you buy a mineral you need to pay attention to the tag if the tag says this is a two ounce per head per day mineral or a four ounce per head per day mineral it's a very simple thing you just look at the total weight of the bag and you count your number of head the cattle in the pen you put it out and you calculate okay so this bag should last 17 days if every animal needs to consume four ounces per day and then after 17 days you just go look in the bunk if that bunk's empty it means they're eating it too fast if they eat it too fast then we need to cut back then you can use salt to cut back on it so the only so they can consume it too fast and they can consume too much uh it is very expensive though so we typically see underconsumption as the biggest problem not overconsumption so it's not often that we find them eating way too much it's it's more often that we find them eating too little um then there is a person that asks so for dairy operation do you recommend multiman at dry off and at calving before rebreeding so the answer to that is yes so uh, a dairy cow is, is significantly different to a beef cow. So so that has a little bit of a different story to it. So when we look at a dairy cow, we really have an additional issue that we deal with. With the dairy cow at dry off, we have a lot of changes that uh, needs to happen in that udder. We need that udder to clean itself. We need to take care of some of the bacteria that's gone in there. Uh, so. We, when we do that injection at dry off, we take care of the udder. We also take care of starting to preload that calf. Now, if we can get into that cow again at about 21 days pre-calving or pre-fresh, it means we've really stacked her very high. So, so that'll take care of making sure that we get a good quality calf and we really get a good quality uh protection of the udder against mastitis we get the uterus to clean itself so in dairy it is a little bit different we preload those cows pretty heavily so the the answer to that question that the, was asked there is yes you are correct so we give it we give it at uh, uh, dry off we give it again just pretty fresh uh, and then she asked uh, there are any other tips for dairy cattle I think the one class of dairy cattle that we actually see the biggest benefit with a multiman product is in young calves. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we ran a, a pretty nice study with Cornell where we took two different uh, calf rearing operations. And it was a nice big study. They had about 780 calves in the study. And we just gave them as they came in, within the first 72 hours of life, half the calves got multiman, the other half did not get it. And we just looked at what was the benefits, you know, what, what was different in outcome. And it was really a scour. Uh, the scours was significantly less in the calves that were supplemented. And I think that's beneficial, uh, just preventing sickness. Because these essential minerals are also very important in the innate immune system, which protects these very young animals. So that's the only other area I would really look at in your dairy is, is looking at those, at those young calves. Uh, then there's a question here, should I remove loose or free choice minerals for a number of days after Multiman 90 dosage? The answer is no. Uh, the Multiman has been formulated to, to act right on top of your oral program at those key points when they need more. Uh, the, the, the beauty of cattle is that the liver in, the, in, in cattle will actually can absorb and store. So if we overdo it a little today and we do nothing tomorrow, uh, there's some in the liver that will give back. So you don't have to take them off mineral when you give multiman. They'll take that additional and it'll be stored in the liver if they don't use it right then. So you don't have to change anything with your diet uh, if you're going to put the multiman in your cattle. And there's another question here. Our cow-calf operation gets free choice salt, mineral, and leak tubs year-round. Products differ during breeding and weaning. Do you still recommend multiman on top of that? Not taking into account the feed. The answer to that is yes. We still we still put multiman in there, uh, especially just those two time points, because we have seen that uh, the the fundamental problem is not the offering, it's what the cattle consume. 
So a cow doesn't consume more because she knows its breeding season is going to start in, in a month's time. Uh, so they unfortunately, they don't change their intake level, even if you offer them more stuff. So we still use that, the Multiman, to drive reproductive efficiency, uh, even though you have those good products out there. Uh, and then there's another question here which says block tubs and loose mineral left out will they lose their effectiveness there's only three things that they can lose if you leave them out for a long time so if we look at if we look at copper sulfate or a copper uh, as a as a chelate in a in a loose mineral uh, unless it rains on it and it gets dissolved or it leaks out of the tub or something it's not going anywhere so with regards to selenium and copper and zinc, those things don't lose potency. The three things that lose potency when we leave it outside is the fat-soluble vitamins, so vitamin A and E. If you put it out in a free-choice mineral tub, bag, or whatever, if it's in direct sunlight, they're going to be destroyed by the sun. So over time, your vitamin A and E loses potency. The other thing that loses potency is iodine. So iodine wants to be a gas. So if we heat it up, oh man, we make it go gas pretty quick. So if you buy in bulk and you're gonna keep a lot of loose mineral for a long period of time, those are the three things that you're gonna lose. You're gonna lose iodine, vitamin A, vitamin E. The rest of the stuff is pretty solid provided it doesn't get wet and leaches out. Um, There's a person that says this will probably sound ridiculous, especially for big operations, but I have just six heifers, first time cattle owner. Could you put the loose minerals in a, uh, in a baked treat for some sort or with the minerals lose effect after being baked? Uh, also thinking of horses too. It's actually, uh, it's not a stupid question at all. If we look at a lot of the protein supplements that we feed to cattle, uh, those things are actually heat treated. So they, uh, a lot of the protein cubes that we feed are actually fortified with minerals. Uh, so provided you're not worried about vitamin A, the stuff I just talked about, if you're going to heat up something uh, and get it as a baked or a pelleted thing, uh, vitamin A, vitamin E, iodine is the ones that's going to disappear. Uh, with the other stuff, we put them in uh, in in. in uh, protein cubes all the time so don't worry about them losing potency uh, if they're baked uh, there's a question here dairy calves when can they receive multiman 90 you can start with them the first day of birth so uh, if they were born this morning you can actually put a, the product into them uh, this afternoon uh, just one word of caution you need to know the body weight of that calf and you need to have a good syringe uh, if you look at the, the dosage rate for a baby calf, it's one cc per 100 pound. So if you have a 55 or a 60 pound calf, uh, you need to have the equipment to put 0.6 cc's into that animal. Uh, they are very susceptible if you overdose. So just when you do very young calves, especially the first three days of life, just be sure that you get the body weight right on them so you don't overdose them. Um, then there's a question here. You talked about injecting Multiman at the lowest injection site sub-Q when giving shots. Uh, is there any specific vaccines that shouldn't be given at the same side of the neck as Multiman? It's actually a very, very good question. The one vaccine that I like to keep away from any other product is Virus Shield. Virus Shield is a great vaccine because it comes packaged with its own adjuvant. Uh, the job of an adjuvant uh, is really to piss off the immune system. It really <laughs> wants to aggravate it. So when 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 you use an oil-based vaccine like Virus Shield, it's going to make a little bit of a knock by itself because it really, I mean, it's a good vaccine. It's going to aggravate the immune system. Now, if anything mixes with that thing, it amplifies that effect. So if you put your wormer, let's say you're going to inject Dactimax or Multimin or whatever, on top of that virus shield, man, you're going to have a swelling that's going to scare you. So the only vaccine that I like to really get away from 
Multimin or any other drug for that matter are the oil-based adjuvanted vaccines like Virus Shield. They're good products, great products, but we need to keep them separate from, from other stuff. I don't know if you have any other questions there. I don't see any other. And Multimin is available in the 500 mil or 100 mil bottle? Yes, if, if you look at those two pack sizes, um, the 100 mil bottle is a, is a small one that you can, you know, you can mount it on a bottle mount gun. Uh, and that 100 mil bottle will treat either 20 mature cows. Uh, Okay, we lost your picture lost your on picture. the feed, but we can still hear you. <laughs> no problem. It's no problem, as long as we can hear you. So I don't see any other questions. So unless, oh, hold on. Oh, there you are, hold on. Let's get you back on there. There, there you are. are. Perfect. Um, we did have a question come in. Susan Evans, what is the shelf life on multi-men once open? Okay, that's a very good question as well. So I'm going to actually answer two different things if you don't mind. So the first one is just if you buy a bottle of multi-men, how long does it last? Uh, so you'll see the FDA regulates how long a product should be uh, kept on the shelf. So you'll see when on every bottle of multi-men that you buy, uh, both on the carton and on the bottle, there's a batch number and an expiry date. So once we go past that expiry date, it means that that product had, cannot be guaranteed to have the same potency as it had while it was still within expiry date. But once you've opened the product, uh, the Multiman product, actually, it's not on the label in the US, uh, but in Europe, it has it on the label. There's a 28-day safe for use after you've opened it so once you've pulled the first you know once you've made the first hole in that rubber uh you can keep it for at least a month uh, you know it'll still be good for a month do you have to refrigerate it no the multiman is a non-refrigerated product you'll see uh it needs to be kept at room temperature um i have a lot of uh, so so now the next question will be if you refrigerate it is it bad the answer is no. I have a lot of people that put it in the fridge with their vaccines, uh, you know, uh, provided that vaccine doesn't get frozen and the multiman doesn't get frozen, it's fine. Uh, don't ever use partially frozen multiman because what happens is the water has gone solid, but a lot of the mineral is still in the little bit of water that's left. So what, is, what has happened? It's become super concentrated. So now it's dangerous because you're going to overdose significantly on selenium and copper. So don't ever use partially frozen product. That's a, that's a very good question you asked there. Uh, so the lady asked here, is the shelf life okay after opening as long as we pull out with clean syringes? I really like to use uh, draw off syringes with these products. Uh, if you go in with needles continuously into product, all products that, that are labeled for multiple uh, use has a preservative in them. But especially if you're working with wet cattle, if, if you're working with cattle that has water on the hide, what happens is on all cattle there's dust and that dust is 80% powdered cow dung. There's a lot of bacteria that's lying on the skin. Now, as long as it's dry, they're not going anywhere, they're not suspended. If you stick a needle through there, well, you might take one, two or three of them with the product that you take in there. It's not gonna be an issue, never. Now, once that animal has rained on and they're wet, now all of that gets suspended and animals are hot. So what happens to that bacteria is it starts growing. So now in that water film, you have a lot of these bacteria that are multiplying. And if you then put a needle through there and you carry it in there, man, you're going to have an abscess. So we don't ever inject wet animals that have been rained on. And secondly, I prefer to use a draw off tube uh, with a big spike in it. So you just take a needle, a uh, normal 18 gauge, 16 gauge needle that you're going to use, make a pilot hole in the rubber because 
manufacturers don't tell you this, but that rubber is finicky. If you take a big spike and you just push it in there, it either tears that rubber and the stuff leaks out or it pushes that rubber right into the bottle. Take a, just take a, the normal syringe, uh, the normal needle you're going to use. You're going to use it again on the animal. That's fine. But take a new one, make a pilot hole, take that big old spike, push it through there, screw it on. Now nothing can get into your bottle. You know, now you have a good piece of equipment. You can start working cattle, adjust the dose, focus on doing good injection techniques. And once you're done, you can take that thing off. You went into that bottle exactly once with that spike. So now you can use that thing over time. Uh, taking a, a, a needle and going into cattle and then, you know, I know how it is, you get busy. And then you don't use clean needles. And then you take one that's been in cattle five times and you put it into the bottle. And before we know, we have contamination. Okay. Perfect. That looks like all the questions for now. Um, when we're done with the segment, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, this will be on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. Um, so ask those questions on Facebook and we'll get back to you. We'll find an answer for you. Um, so, Dr. Havinga, do you have anything else to add before we wrap up the segment? No, I really don't. The uh, only thing I like to say always is, you know, I, I thank people for their time because, you know, time is the one commodity you can never give back. So I hope everybody got something out of it uh, because it would be a crying shame if I wasted your time. So thank <laughs> you so much for your time and have a great rest of your day. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Great job. All right, let's go ahead. We're going to draw the winner for the $75 gift towards uh, gift card to use towards the purchase of Multi Men 90. Okay, so the winner today is Terry Gurley. Yay! Congratulations, Terry. <laughs> Terry, if you're still watching, go ahead and send us a PM so we can claim your prize and we'll get that taken care of. So, all right. Thank you, Dr. Havinga, so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Everybody, have a great day. Bye-bye.